Hello Upgraders, it's Will here and welcome to another episode of the Upgraded Ape Show. On today's show, we have Elisabetta Ferenza, the author of The Energy Code, who is also an expert in human performance, specialising in the area of epigenetics. We go pretty deep in this episode and we talk about how your thoughts can physically alter your DNA, then we go even deeper into the realm of the quantum world. But don't worry, we bring it all back up together into some really actionable advice at the end of the show. For those of you who are looking to improve your brain and your mindset and your thought patterns, and then we talk about the benefits of doing that. I loved having Elizabeth on the show because we talked about some topics that could be slightly woo-woo, but with us both having science backgrounds, studies were cited, and some of the bullshit was taken away, and I really think this is a great episode, and I really look forward to hearing your thoughts on the comments at radio.gradedape.com and we mention a bunch of books that are listed there as well. Just before we get into the show, just a quick note that this show is sponsored by the upgradedape.com store where you can find all kinds of awesome high-performance coffee, MTC oil, which is a specific oil that can go through the blood-brain barrier and just be used without digestion so you get an instant and healthy energy boost. There's loads more on there, and you can check that out at shop.upgradedape.com. And so without further ado, let's get on with the show. Welcome to the Upgraded Ape Show, your daily dose of brain upgrades to help you kick life's ass. And here's your host, Will Barron. Hi, Elizabeth, and welcome to the Upgraded Ape Show. Are you okay today? I'm just fantastic, Will. How are you? I am good. Well, today we're going to dive into some... Stuff that you brought up which blew my mind when we mentioned it on the Get More Done show. That is quantum psychology. Is it Nordic Nordic science? Noetic. Noetic science. And yeah, I'm just keen to pick your brains and look into this because it sounded fascinating when we mentioned it on the other show. Can you just give us, before we jump into all this, a quick intro to yourself and how you came into the world of these two sciences? Well, as I shared with um, your listeners last time we spoke, uh, really my beginnings was that I, I had a rare genetic condition that medicine didn't really have any answers for other than to to point out the things that, that would be dangerous for me to, to eat. Uh, as time went on, I was, you know, and I grew up, I was just trying to find answers. So from about the age of eight, I started to read everything that I possibly could about uh, science, biology, even philosophy, the, the science of the mind. And that that led me to get an understanding of of how we work, probably from a philosophical point of view. Then as the science around genetics developed, I read everything I could on that because it's I have a genetic disorder and also the emerging fields of, of um, quantum psychology, um, psychoneuroimmunology and how we affect the state of our body because I was constantly beating the odds um, and those odds were pretty bad. And I really wanted to understand, you know, why me? People would say things to me like, you know, you're chosen by God or all this stuff. And I just went, what a load of rubbish. (laughs) Um, There is a, there is reasoning behind this. There is a, there is something behind this that isn't just a miraculous one-off. There is something in this that I can, I can learn about and therefore I can employ. And then as I got older, I realized it was something I could share with other people uh, so that the, the circumstances you might find yourself born into aren't the circumstances that necessarily need to determine your life outcomes. Awesome. Awesome story. And we will link to the other show in the show notes. So can we start with quantum psychology? Can you tell us a little bit about what that is? Well, it's it's not really a field of science. It's more a term that represents a mindfulness approach to living and a growing kind of field of counselling. Um, the idea is to use reflective techniques to observe when our motivation might be coming, where, where that motivation might be coming from um, or what automatic programming might be driving our behaviour. So quantum psychology really considers the mind as a, as a series of unconscious software programs that are driving our behaviour. 
And the practitioner of quantum psychology, whether you're practicing it on yourself or you might be a counsellor using these techniques with a client, is to learn to gain awareness over these unconscious and automatic programs and therefore be able to edit those programs uh, and gain control over them. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So treating the brain as a computer, essentially, with thoughts running as processes. Yes, exactly. And, and you know, in some parts of quantum psychology, we we don't think of it just as the brain as the processing center. It's kind of like the central processing center, but really all of the body, all of the cells in the body and the DNA are part of that, that processing and storage facility. And there's software running all of the time through all of the body. So is this like Bruce Lipton's The Biology of Belief cells have some kind of consciousness attached to them and that we're built up into a larger consciousness together? Yes, that you, you've exactly got it. You know, Bruce Lipton's work has been very influential because he talks about all of the organelles that a cell has. So a cell has all of the senses that the collective human being has and is scanning the environment all of the time and determining which sequences of the genome are being replicated or silenced so it's really the cell that makes the decision about you know where the methyl tags are placed on the cell to to blind um, the copying process to that particular code so um, out of that is the idea that cell you know single cell organisms existing hundreds of millions of years ago learnt to cooperate for their own survival and so you started to get synergistic relationships between groups of cells and those groups of cells created more complex organisms so you know a single cell pretty much just has to defend itself and eat that that's that's pretty much all it can do and it'll have a niche in the ecosystem that then you know that's its niche that's its 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 little area and if you wipe out that part of the environment then that uh, cell has a hard time existing and may become ex extinct unless it, as it replicates itself there is a mutation that allows it to alter that niche when you have multiple cells coming together, you increase the ability to alter and change a niche if the environment has a, a shift. And you start to be able to do, as a collective organism, you start to be able to do more things than just eat and defend yourself. And so what Bruce Lipton talks about, and he, you know, he's a professor of bi biology, this is not just some guy who woke up with a, a weird idea, <laughs> You know, he's taught in some of the best medical schools in the United States uh, and uh, and really had a aha moment while he was teaching students, I think in Hawaii, um, if my memory serves me. And, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and he really saw that it was a symbiotic process that led to the development of more complex organisms. Those more complex organisms could then uh, specialise um, they had more adaptive ability and that there was this great benefit to organisms coming together. Now, we are, you know, we have more DNA in us that doesn't belong to us than does. And so it makes you want, really ask the question, well, what is us? You know, the amount of, of genetic material that's foreign that's in our gut but is absolutely crucial to our survival defies you know logic but but we couldn't we could not exist without all of that bacteria and all of those foreign critters in our gut because they synthesize the building blocks for all of our neurotransmitters in the brain so if your gut is out then you can't produce serotonin you, you have trouble producing the the kinds of brain chemistry that allows you to feel the normal range of emotions so, uh, but it's not just that. You've got a microbe on your eyelashes, uh, you know, it's, it's that literally eats dust and keeps your eyelashes clean. And, <laughs> and so when, you know, you use, it, not you, but when, say, people use mascara. Yeah, it's not a good look for me. It's <laughs> not a good look. It, it, it can kill off that, uh, suffocate that little critter and it can't do its job. And very often people who use mascara a lot lose their eyelashes. So there's all of these kind of weird and wacky things. You know, you have chloroplasts in the back of your eyes. That they are a they're a plant. They're, you know, they're a plant cell. They're in the back of the eyes, helping you to perceive ultraviolet light if you can shift the light onto that part of the retina. So the, we have a myriad of creatures 
in, in us and around us. We have yeast bacteria all over our skin protecting our skin. We are a symbiotic creature, whether we want to admit it or not, and our survival and health depends on maintain our job really is to maintain the environment for all of these critters so they can do their job to, to give you an example this is something i only learned recently a, a cow does not actually digest the grass that it eats and it doesn't derive any energy from that grass did you know that no okay so in the rumen there are bacteria that eat the grass and when they uh-huh. die they provide the protein that the cow lives off. That is fascinating. Isn't that and that's fascinating? something I've thought about <laughs> before of how can a cow get so big and strong by eating grass? Yes. So there's this the, crazy. Yeah, so the, the cow itself can't get anything from the grass. The bacteria eats the grass, thrives, lives its life, dies, and then it's that protein that the cow lives off. And so if you give a cow heaps of antibiotics and you kill that bacteria in its gut, and you open up the gut, the grass will be as green as it was when the, when the cow ate it. So nothing wow. will have happened. <laughs> but normally it would look like this kind of brown, fecally mush because uh-huh. it's been processed by the bacteria. So, so it's everywhere. We are symbiotic creatures. Uh, we are collections of different organisms working that have found a way to benefit each other. So we eat the food. You know, we do the work to buy the food and eat it so that the bacteria in our gut get what they need and we get some energy benefit out of it. But they're really producing all the important stuff, all the high value, you know, um, I suppose down the chain processes are occurring Mm -hmm. through other critters. Well, I'm actually doing an experiment at the moment, which was brought up by another podcast guest of eating potato starch before bed and this is said it's not done it yet but it's apparently can cause lucid dreaming Mm -hmm. because it feeds a particular bacteria that produces a neurochemical a neurotransmitter that is associated well acetylcholine which is associated with lucid dreaming so i've not induced it yet but i've been varying the dosages so that's a testament to what you've just said well which might explain also why quite a lot of alcohol is made from fermented potato (laughs) <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, bringing this back to the brain yeah. and the programs that you mentioned a minute ago, these programs then, from what you just said, do they come from the environment affecting cells and it working its way up the chain? Do they come from innate patterns that are locked into our genes and DNA or are our behaviors and patterns learned as behaviors? All three. So we now know that if your parents experienced a particular trauma, that you are more likely to be anxious. We know that if your parent has a particular phobia, maybe one that nobody in their you know genetic line had before, but they develop that phobia and it's strong phobia that before you were born, that you'll have a predisposition to that very same phobia. So there is there is uh, there is definitely a genetic component but now, we now we now how know How does that, that work though Elizabeth? Yeah. I mean sorry to interrupt you but I I've, I've seen studies where they've shown a a baby that is you know, too young to speak and communicate but they show a baby a toy snake and it's not fussed but then it shows the baby a video of a real snake and innately it mm. tries to get away from it. How are these things stored in our genes and how is that proven and tested? You can you can gain the evidence anecdotally, but it's been it's been proven genetically in that they assess the markers that are altered and then see if those markers are inherited and they and they are. But think about it this way: every other animal on the planet, well, most animals on the planet, their young are quite self sufficient very early and inherit have most of those behaviours uh, as just inherited behaviours that maybe just need refinement. So most animals have an enormous ability to be self-sufficient at quite a young age. We are, you know, with the other primates, we are, you know, some of the slowest to mature and to be able to become independent. So in fact, if you look in nature, you would see that inherited phobias and understandings of what a threat is and what food is and knowing if you're a prey animal or a predator those things are innate. They're, they are written into the genome and they are passed down from generation to generation. Uh, we are actually more of an anomaly because so much of what we are isn't 
so much has to be learned. And I think a lot of that comes down to things like, for example, I think we talked about last time, the difference between a human baby and a, a chimp baby is that a human baby gets to a certain brain weight at 12 months of age. And a a, a chimp baby doesn't get there until they're nearly three. Mm-hmm. What happens is because um, brain cells, that f- neurons that fire together, wire together, we create mind maps through repetition. So at one year of age, a, an infant doesn't have as many mind maps you know, kind of set down as um, a chimp would at three years of age. And so half of the motor neuron capacity, the the motor capacity of the brain is handed over to the voice box. So we have babies learning to speak and speak with uh, amazing tonal differences and complexity, whereas a chimp can't ever learn to do that because by the time their brain is big enough to spare the space, broker's area is cannot be handed over. It's hardwired into manual dexterity. So our, our quickly growing brain and the size of our brain is really important. Interestingly, we have discovered that Neanderthals had much bigger brains, which may, may mean that they had more inherited behavior. So more of it, more of the skills, the brain had to be bigger because it, had to, it just had to remember so much more from an early age. Mm. But we, we, do, we really don't know their guesses. Sure. So, so we have this ability to learn quickly as human beings, to have inherited behaviours and then for the environment to really determine which of those inherited behaviours get activated. And then through repetition, they become our behaviours. So the programming, it's like there's an, there's, it's like a, a software catalogue or an app catalogue is in our DNA. So whatever our ancestors have done creates an app if they did it more than, you know, a few times and it became automatic. So that, that became an app that's sitting in our genes that we just haven't, we kind of haven't, you know, activated. It's a bit like on your phone, you might download a, an app, but until you open it, it's potential, it's not running. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. So can we download and install new apps then over time if we don't yeah. like what is there? Yeah, absolutely we can. So we have this amazing ability as human beings to not only use the apps that are, you know, that we've inherited, but to have new apps created. And it seems that the that our genetic material is very uh, susceptible to programming through uh, activity, through behaviour, and through what we hear. So there's been quite a few um, pieces of research going on around the world where they look at the impact of sound on genetic material. And if you think about it, a lot of the programs, behavioural programs that we may dislike as, you know, in ourselves as adults are ones that were kind of put there by our parents or by our teachers or the significant people uh, that were there when we were young and impressionable. And so we know that hypnotherapy, and I'm a hypnotherapist, we know that hypnotherapy works through tone of voice and specific language, the use of language. And we see it time and time again where where people's behaviours are permanently changed through hypnosis. So there, there's a lot of research going on to understand why the talking therapies are so effective. And it seems to be that our DNA is particularly suscept- susceptible to the influence of language, so the spoken word, and to sound. Now, this isn't surprising since other studies are showing that our DNA actually is a language, that it has all of the components of, of language. It has syntax. It, it has meaning. Uh, and so therefore it may very well have been the first language and that has influenced our ability to communicate. So our, our innate ability to develop language is derived from the fact that there is language in every one of our cells. So are you saying that during a hypnotherapy session, your DNA is changing on the fly to, to your voice and your message? Yes. Now, experiments show that you need to be in a very particular kind of brainwave state, what you'd call a trance state, but which we know is between 
five and 10 cycles per second. So if you were looking, say, at an EEG or a lie detector, you'd be seeing the brain activity at that pace. So when you're really busy, it's over 30 cycles per second. So, you know, that, that's a, that would be a lie detector where the needle is moving really, really quickly and creating lots of, of, of these high and low amplitude lines. Um, when you uh, are in a sort of a, you know, daydreamy state, that's really what we call a hypnagogic state and below five cycles per second you're asleep okay under zero you're you're in incredibly deep sleep or moving starting to you know you're in a coma so most people sleep at three to five and hypnosis is, is five to ten and we know that in that state uh, the genome seems to be particularly susceptible to suggestion now we only we only know that recently we, we just thought we were talking to the mind not knowing mm. what the mind was and that somehow it was doing something magical and I think you've guessed from now on that the magical explanation doesn't fly with me very well <laughs> uh, but a lot of research is being done that shows that that in our human genome, we, we have much fewer codes than you would expect. People thought we would have hundreds of thousands. We have about 30,000. We have, I think I said to you last, we have about the same as a fruit fly and some particularly beautiful, you know, flowers. But the thing with the human genome is that it can be read in multiple ways depending on where you start reading the code. And there are multiple languages being employed. So whether, so depending on what is required, the same code is read with a different filter. D does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay. And so therefore, out of the same genetic material, you can get lots and lots of information and you can produce all the processes that a human being needs. Now, when they looked at the human genome, they found that the majority of the material in the genome looked to be junk in that it, it didn't make sense. It was packing code that we could decode. And I remember reading that's just because we don't have the tools to decode it, which is kind of the quantum view. You know, depending on how, what tools you use to look at something, that'll determine the result you get. And it seemed to me that it would be ridiculous for us to have all this broken junk code sitting there and, and only a small percentage of it being readable code. It was more likely that we just weren't able to read it and that's turned out to be the case. The majority of the junk code is what is, is either <clears throat> substrate to build code, so it's kind of like the tools of, of code lying around waiting to be put together. Um, but some of it seems to be related to behavioural code. So a large amount of what we thought was junk is actually very mutable code. It doesn't have the same layers of code protection on it that say, you know, the code that determines you have two eyes and one nose. Mm -hmm. but, but it's there. And so the defences around changing it are much less. Uh, and I have a theory and, I, I, you know, there's no experiment um, to test this, but I have a theory that a lot of the archetypal images that people see in and talk about in religion, in nightmares, you know, in the occult, in um, fiction, uh, and that patients often report when they're having, you know, either psychoanalytic or hypnotic sessions, they're actually almost like the animation or the avatar of, of the protective code. And it's kind of saying to you, are you sure you want to go in here? <laughs> you have to prove that you're worthy and you understand how this works before I'm going to let you into the next level. And I mean, as I said, this is this is an untested theory. It is just what I have observed in, you know, 26 years of being a hypnotherapist. So I think that I think that if you are persistent and if you focus on a particular clear thought in a relaxed state where, you know, you are in that daydreamy or meditative or hypnagogic state and you, you persist in the particular thought or process of behaviour that you want – that you want to change to, not focusing on the one that you want to change, but what you want to change to, I see real change happen for people. I, I use it on myself. All, I mean, I'm my first guinea pig. I had, uh, I remember when I first qualified as a hypnotherapist and, uh, you know, I really got down into the nitty gritty and asked all sorts of inconvenient questions that people couldn't answer. So I started to, to 
think about it and go, well, okay, if, if, if we can really have an, an effect and I'd seen experiments where people's perception of cold and hot had completely changed, where people went through surgery without anesthetic, where people were able to heal much faster after burns because they'd be given hypnotic suggestions, you know, at the site of, of the, the injury at, within the first, you know, hour or so of a traumatic burn. And, and they recovered much quicker because their perception of the burn was shifted. So I started to do things like you know, I didn't have particularly good skin in my 20s. So I started to look in the mirror, put myself into a relaxed state and say my skin is clear and clean. Its texture is perfect, even when I was looking at a, you know, a face full of pimples. So and that worked. Within three months, I had clear skin and I've had clear skin for the rest of my life. Well, this brings us nicely into the world of intention. So it, it fascinates me because at first I totally dismissed it and I just called bullshit on it, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And the book that changed my thoughts on it was The Intention Experiment. I don't know if you've come across that. I haven't. I haven't. But I'm really glad you didn't say The Secret because I would have baffed uh, no, no. To a bin somewhere. <laughs> well, the secret. I've so it's a film, isn't it? And it's a book. I've not it's seen it or read it, and that that's what puts me off the whole thing, yeah. or yeah. what put me off the whole thing. Of you think about something, and then it just appears weeks down the line. Yeah. But the intention experiment, the the experiment that stuck out in my mind was that there was a random number generator, and I don't quote me on this, but because I read it quite a while ago, but there's random number number generators across the world. Mm -hmm. And they were just generating random numbers and there was nothing to report. Other than one day, all of a sudden, there was a massive spike in regularity in the numbers. Mm -hmm. And then it dropped back down. And then ever since, it's been exactly the same. And that day just happened to be September the 11th, mm -hmm. which is too much of a coincidence. And these are running in different labs and different universities throughout the world. They're not linked in any way. And so that then put me in my mind onto the kind of Bruce Lipton side of things of, if your cells are all communicating and working together to make you, perhaps then that humans are all kind of somehow linked to create something bigger than yourself. Yeah. And then, then the book goes into other experiments of security guards looking down a camera and people knowing when they're being looked at, like more often than not, it being right. And then there's the anecdotal story that everyone's had of you think about someone and then they ring you yeah. on the phone. The book ties all this together into this quantum web of anti the secret and more yeah. <laughs> science that we don't really understand, but it's fascinating. Yeah, and 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 this uh, a lot of those um, anecdotes and 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 that particular research you're talking about um, is it's quite well known and it's been validated in a number of ways. The research that really got me excited was done uh, in the US by um, Vladimir Paponin who was on loan from the Russian Academy of Sciences and it's been replicated many times since. Um, what he did, he was in Colorado and in his lab they were trying to understand the phantom leaf effect where, you know, say a leaf has been cut in half and yet its electromagnetic field still shows an intact leaf. Uh, and he thought that it might also explain the phantom limb effect, uh, although through brain plasticity we we actually can get quite a simple and clear understanding of what the phantom limb effect is, why people still get an itchy foot when they don't have a foot. But what Vladimir Paponin did is over a number of years of you know trial and error, he came up with an experiment where he uh, placed um, – he used a vacuum – and measured the position of photons in the vacuum because when when a vacuum is you know in, is clear and perfect, it will always have photons in it. You you can't get those out. Uh -huh. So like packets of light. So what they did is they they tried putting different things into the vacuum and see to see if they altered the position of the photons. And when they put DNA into the vacuum, that's when the photons changed. And in some cases, the change in the pattern of the photons lasted for over a month after the DNA was removed. And they, they went into a distinct pattern that seemed to be somehow influenced by the presence of the DNA as if there was a message from the DNA electromagnetically influencing the photons. So that's one experiment and it's been repeated many times throughout the world. 
Another experiment was done uh, by the US military and they took a group of army recruits and they got them to, to donate some leukocytes and they put the uh, leukocytes um, into apparatus that they could measure the electromagnetic field and discharge of the DNA in the leukocytes. They then put the uh, 18 year old recruits in separate rooms to their donated cells and got them to watch a range of movies that were you know funny scary erotic action boring all sorts of things and they had them all wired up to measure their electromagnetic responses and to measure and they were measuring simultaneously each of their donated leukocyte uh, dna and what they found is that the dna responded instantly and identically to the response of the individual who donated the DNA. So they had them in separate rooms and they said, oh, okay, I wonder if this is a local effect. So they kept moving the samples further and further away. And they basically, the experiment was halted at 350 miles. They (laughs) still could not get any difference. So the DNA felt what the donor felt. Instantly (laughs) and with no lessening of effect, they felt it to the same degree that the donor was feeling, was having experiences. Then another study was done by the Institute of Heart Math. And the Institute of Heart Math is a really interesting organisation. It was originally, it was, it was founded by a group of scientists, some cardiologists, some um, quantum biologists, psychoneuroimmunologists, physicists. And they do a lot of work looking at the electromagnetic field of the heart uh, because it's 2,000 times larger than the electromagnetic field emitted by the brain. And I read a book which is really worth getting hold of if you can. I don't know if it's still in print, but I imagine it would be. It's called The Heart's Code. And it was written by a whole lot of uh, heart surgeons who had, um, dis- who had noted that when, that when people received a donated organ, parts of their personality changed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and sp- Normally, you could only get that information anecdotally. You know, you, um, friends and family would comment that they, you know, went from having a bland diet to liking, um, you know, Indian food. Uh, and when the researchers looked into it, that, you know, kidney had been donated by someone of, of um, you know, Indian race. Yeah. Uh, and they could speak to family and friends and things like that and and get this anecdotal evidence. But then they discovered, you know, the rare case of someone who has cystic fibrosis where they they donate heart and lungs because they need new lungs. Their heart is often fine, but they need new lungs. But you cannot get a set of lungs unless you take the heart as well. You you know, it's it's kind of a set. It works together. Mm -hmm. So they they donate their heart. Um, their their heart and lungs are removed, and they get it. They get a new heart and lung set. So now you you have the, for the first time someone who has donated a heart being able to be interviewed, because generally if you donate a heart, you don't live to tell the tale. So what they discovered is that in people who had uh, received a heart, they it was as if they gained a whole new purpose and view of life. So how they fitted into life completely changed. They uh, almost like a personality change. And when uh, the the donor was spoken to, they all they felt that they had changed, and they had lost something but gained something else. So that's what the Institute of Heart Math sort of really founded around the this. We want to know what's going on. We are observing these effects, and we want to try to understand what's going on. So they do a lot of research. One particular study they did is they trained twenty eight psychology students to manifest emotions on demand. So, and this obviously took quite some time, but these people could become instantly happy, instantly sad, instantly angry, etc. They gave each of them a sample from an unknown person, not related to any of them, a sample of their, of their DNA. And they were asked uh, to focus particular emotions for particular amounts of times onto these samples of DNA that were in Petri dishes. So, and they measured the effects on the DNA. So this is not the person's own DNA, this is somebody else's DNA. And when they felt positive emotions like 
love, joy, gratitude, peace, connection, the DNA uncoiled. It lengthened and it lit up. When those same researchers were asked to feel negative emotions like guilt, anger, fear, rage, the DNA coiled. It curled right up and the, and it's, the, the light switched off. So it, it <laughs> shut down its electromagnetic field. So I talk about in my book that if you put all of these various studies together, what you're looking at is, is clearly an electromagnetic effect. We know it because it's been measured. But that electromagnetic effect carries information and it carries information, you know, in a loop uh, within our bodies and from person to person and into our environment. So within our bodies, it is, you know, what you focus on and feel is being listened to and experienced by all of your cells. They are bathing in that electromagnetic signature and that information and they follow that command. They're programmed by it. So if you persistently have negative, rageful emotions, we know that correlates with high blood pressure, with, you know, a whole, with coronary heart disease, with a whole lot of physical conditions that aren't great for you. So you have this internal biofeedback loop, this internal communication of electromagnetic information being shared by your body and your well, mind. That's- that's what I'd love to quickly wrap up on because we're coming running mm. up to time here and you're going to have to come back on the show and do another <laughs> one because uh, there's so much more to go at. Yeah. But coming back to the brain and your thought patterns and you've just explained that that can affect your DNA. What can listeners do other than getting a transplant of a lung from someone <laughs> super successful? What can they do to change the, I guess, DNA and the whole mindset and consciousness and, and everything? What can they do to improve themselves well I, in looking at the research i've identified seven steps so the first one is understand what what software is running you now what is your current mindset is that mindset getting you the results that you want in your health and in your life and relationships if it's not have a look at what that mindset is made up of what are the belief systems that are you know creating those mind map patterns Number two, understand your personality because that's going to help you to understand how to maximize. It's kind of like working out what model of hardware you're running on, you know, and so because that's innate, personality is innate. So once you understand what you're set up to do and how you're set up to experience the world, then you can maximize, you can have the right software for that hardware. Then I think it's really, really crucial to look at the inputs in your life. What are you putting into your life in terms of food, in terms of uh, the people around you, the messages you allow into your life, uh, the influences in the media? You know, are, the, is that, are those messages serving the program that you want to be running? Then what are you doing with your energy? Are you just wasting it? Are you expending it on things that aren't moving you to your goal? Or are you focused and, and able to direct that energy in a way that's going to, to get you to where you want to go and, and have a great life in the present? Then looking at things like what your attitude is in the moment. So once you become aware of the bigger patterns of your mindset, it's useful to look at yourself in any day and go, where's my attitude sitting right now? Is it positive or is it negative? Because if it's negatively charged, I'm sending a negative message to my body and out into the world through my electromagnetic field that is going to call negative to me. Mm Mm-hmm. Then you then I've developed a tool called the energy mode, which is really understanding that for a particular period of time, are you constructive, destructive, regenerative, reflective, and therefore what are the types of activities that are going to help you, you know, to to stay well in that mode and move into a more productive mode. And then finally, wrapping it all up by having a perspective of mindfulness. So looking at yourself reflecting, you don't have to be in a trance to do it. You just reflect, you just stop for, you know, a half a minute or a minute as you're doing your normal tasks and going, okay, where am I sitting right now? What pro- am, I, am I running a conscious program or am I running a destructive unconscious program? And then knowing that you have the power to shift that. And the more you practice it, the better you get at it, the better that program becomes. Uh huh. And they're great points, and it's a great structure as well. I'm really impressed with that. And two points from me, just to add on, is one, I quit listening and watching anything other than mm-hmm. very, very local news about yeah. a year ago. Yeah. And I've just felt amazing since. There's yep. just, you, you're not designed to know what's going on. Obviously, it's useful to know big picture stuff occasionally, but you're right, you can't change it, and you're not designed to know what's going on all around the world. And inherently, 
for some reason, people like to listen to bad news. So mm. most news is bad and depressing. Yeah. And two, yeah, as you mentioned then, knowing these patterns and understanding that there are patterns that run, that you get up and you go, oh, I can't be asked today or oh, I'm a bit miserable today and you don't realize it. If you do it every single day, it's so ingrained into you that you can literally become a miserable person just because of that. And just a, a exactly. small mindset shift in the morning can make a massive difference to the rest of your day and then your rest of your life from that point onwards. That's, that, that is exactly right. Um, and, and they're simple. It doesn't cost any money to do any of these things. Uh, that's all within the power of each and every one of us. And the great thing is that because the second part of the study I was talking about was it was that the our electromagnetic fields influence other people's cells. If mm-hmm. you become the brightest light in your family or in your environment, then people will follow by example. You will have people, you know, be naysayers and, and try to stop you because a lot of people are very entrenched in the way they are and they don't like any threat to that and they want to be able to predict your behaviour because it's easier. And so when you change, they will really resist and fight that. But a lot of people will come with you. Um, not because you're telling them what to do, not because you're preaching at them, but because you're an example. And the person with the brightest, strongest electromagnetic field, they get the most followers. They get the most people joining them in whatever it is they're doing. So you don't have to be, you know, a billionaire who owns a a news company. You don't have to be, uh, you know, a, a charismatic despot to be influential. You don't have to be a slimy salesman. If you live in alignment with your beliefs, then your cells are in alignment, your electromagnetic field is broadcasting a consistent message, you will have more energy and people are drawn to energy. Wow. Well summed up, Elizabeth, and it's, it's really powerful stuff. Oh, thank you. Thanks for, for having me on to share the message. Oh, no, you're welcome. You're welcome. Can you tell the audience a little bit more where they can find about your books and where they can find you online as well? Certainly. So my website is elizabettalfayenza.com and I'm sure that Will's got that on his website for people to um, to link yeah, to. Yeah, we'll put that in the show notes. Letters. Yep. <laughs> and uh, you can also find my books on Amazon. So uh, just look for The Energy Code um, by Elizabetta Alfayenza because there are other energy codes around, but they're generally about a- the atomic energy. Very different. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and yeah, and my website has lots of resources, lots of downloadable documents. There's lots of videos that are um, tools for the book. So you can use those uh, videos to help you to get all of the key principles and, and practice them in your life. Awesome stuff. Well, I just want to say thanks again for your time today. Really appreciate it. And yeah, I've learned a lot and I'm sure the audience will have as well. Great. Well, I love what you do and look forward just to uh, talking to you and, uh, and your listeners again really soon. Cheers. Bye.